Hey guys, new disclaimer. I am not sure what's true or false in this video. I take gossip and tea from online, from magazines, from books, from word of mouth, from all over, and I ball it up together and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to the video. Hey, Scandalites and Sesso Squad. This is Ashley with Ashley Sesso, and I am back with another Old Hollywood Scandals video. But honey, before we get started, let me tell y'all something, because baby, I got some news for y'all, honey. So listen, y'all know how I've been trying to figure out that little secret move that Anna Gordy Gay was doing with Marvin? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Baby, I am on my way to figuring it out because, honey, I am ordering products from Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm, that's right. I'm about to order me some products to spice up my... <coughs> and child, if Adam and Eve ain't got the answer, then baby, I don't know who does. Because, honey, the tea on the street is that they are the number one adult toy store source in the world. And while y'all sitting up there waiting on me to find the answer, baby, y'all need to be finding the answer for yourself, honey. Go ahead and go to adamandeve.com and get 50% off on one item and free shipping for your entire order for the U.S. and Canada. Yes, I said it. That offer is available to all of you guys, but there's one thing you have to do. You have to say the scandal, child. That's right. The discount code is scandal so go ahead over there honey order you something once again use the discount code scandal and tell them you were sent by me the most scandalous storyteller of all now since you guys have gotten your little pesky information for yourselves let's get into the pesky information in this video by talking about the one and only majestic entertainer mr sammy davis jr Let's get to it. Samuel George Davis Jr. was born on December the 8th, 1925 in the Harlem section of Manhattan, New York City. His mother's name was Elvira Sanchez, who was a tap dancer, and his father's name was Samuel George Davis Sr., and he also was an entertainer. And he was actually way more known than Sammy's mother, Elvira. Now, rumor has it that Sammy told everybody that his mother was Puerto Rican when, in fact, she was Cuban. But it's said the reason that he did this is because the time period that he lived through, Cubans were hated. And so he lied to protect his career, himself, as well as his parents. Now, since Sammy's mother and father were entertainers, they were always, always on the road traveling from show to show. And this meant that Sammy was raised by his paternal grandmother. Now, this was all well and good. Mr. and Mrs. Davis were able to protect their son from a stressful life on the road. But unfortunately, they were not able to protect themselves from the stressful life on the road. It became too much. It became too stressful. And their marriage broke down. And when they found they could no longer stand each other and didn't even want to see each other anymore, they ended up splitting up. And as soon as they did, Sammy's father raced into town to his mother's house to pick up his son and take his son on the road with him because he was so scared that his wife was going to basically talk to the courts and say that she wanted full custody of her son because he's living with his grandmother. So his dad, in order to stop all that, just went and got his son and took him with him. Now, because this happened, it definitely made all the work they put in to keep Sammy from stress on the road it made that redundant since he took his son on the road anyway but it did not matter because Sammy Davis Jr. enjoyed being on the road he became a stage brat he was definitely a showbiz kid and before long he was able to dance and do all of the moves that his father Sammy Davis Sr. as well as his father's dance partner Will Maston were doing in fact he became so good at these moves that soon his father and Will Maston let little bitty Sammy Sammy become a part of their dance troupe and they became the Will Maston Trio. So the traveling showbiz life was really good for Sammy Davis Jr. In fact, it was not only that they were a dance trio, they actually were a family. Like Will and Sammy Davis Sr. really made a, a bond with little Sammy Davis Jr. As a matter of fact, Will Maston ended up being his godfather. If there was a lot of patience and a lot of time spent on little Sammy Davis Jr., and the boy became good. I mean, real good. And I say this because gossip says that the little baby boy stole the show every single time. As little Sammy's star shined brighter and brighter, he was soon cast for a movie called Rufus Jones for President. And his little high-pitched singing voice, as well as his comedic timing, made him a true darling of black cinema. But he was up against a lot of more little black true darlings of black cinema. And they were a little bit more darling than his behind was. So he wasn't cast for another movie role for a while. But this was okay. Sammy was happy to spend his young life traveling and dancing with his father and Will Maston. And per Sammy himself, 
himself, he really, really enjoyed life at this time. And that was because his father and Will, like I said before, made sure he was loved and they showed him a good time and they praised him and, you know, did all kinds of stuff to lift a young boy's spirit. But what Sammy didn't know is that Will and his father were working very, very hard to give him this experience. And let me explain to you what I mean by this, because you see, the reason Sammy's life was so good is because all he experienced was love, affection, appreciation. That is all he experienced. And Sammy thought the whole world was like this, okay? Because his father and Will Maston like overshowered him with this type of emotion, with this type of affection, they overdid it. And it was because they were trying to protect him from racism. Gossip says that they felt like if they could overshower him and give him all this love and affection, that by the time he grew older, maybe this racist stuff would calm down a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Maybe he wouldn't have to face what they had to face. So really they were shielding Sammy from the outside world and he thought everything was all roses. At any time they did experience anything negative, any type of racist stuff, his father and Will Mastin would hurry up and say, oh, you know, don't pay attention to that person. They're just jealous of you. They're jealous of your talent. And the thing is, is that yes, some racism is based on jealousy. Sometimes people are just jealous of people and they hide that behind their racism. But they fail to tell Sammy that sometimes it ain't got nothing to do with jealousy. Sometimes these folks just hate you because of the color of your skin. You could be sleeping on the sidewalk, baby, and somebody come kick you in the back of your head. You ain't done nothing to that person. There's nothing for them to even be jealous of. You're sleeping on the side of the road. But it's just because of your skin color. Sammy didn't know that this world existed. So when he turned 18 years old, he got a big, fiery, juicy backhand to the face. And that is because he had to put his dancing shoes aside and he had to join the military. Sammy said that he faced the worst racism in his life when he was in the military. And it was very cruel. The racism itself was cruel, but also the way he experienced it was cruel because he had no sense of this before. So he gets there and he tells stories of, you know, white guys just jumping on him. You know what I'm saying? And he don't know why this is happening, but he does know after getting punched in the face a few times that he has to defend himself. So he is fighting all the time. And for a while, he still doesn't get it. Why are these guys jumping on him like this? What is he even doing to them? Then it finally dawns on him that he's not doing anything to them and that they hate him because he's black. And once Sammy realized this, it got worse from there. His nose, that flat appearance, that was not Sammy's nose at first. And throughout these fights, Sammy's nose was broken so much that it never did form again. It was like the bone and the cartilage in his nose was like, hey, listen, baby, we keep on forming back up, we keep getting broke. So this time we out. And they shot the deuces on him. Sammy's nose just like stayed flat because it got broken so much. Now, although Sammy had to fight plenty of guys, he told a story of this one guy who made his life a living hell. And this guy was called Jennings. And Jennings was a bully, baby. I am talking about a bully. One story says that Sammy had gotten a watch from his dad, okay? It was a very expensive watch that his dad had gifted him. So Sammy one day was like looking at the watch, trying it on or something to that effect. And Jennings came and took the watch from him, all right? Sammy is like, give me my watch back, man. And Jennings is like, no, you ain't getting this back. And so he's tossing it back and forth with his friends, okay? So after tossing it maybe four or five times the friend tosses it back to Jennings Jennings steps back and let the watch fall on the ground and then out of nowhere just takes his foot and just stomps you know just crushes the watch the watch pieces go everywhere then when Sammy is looking mortified that this is happening to his watch Jennings gonna sit up there and tell him that's okay n-word Go steal another watch just like you stole it out. And then Gossip says Sammy talked about another fight that supposedly Jennings was involved in. And in this fight, Sammy was in the bathroom. While he is finishing and pulling up his pants, Jennings walks in and he corners him. Sammy tries to run away, of course, and the guys end up cagging him up and tripping him up and he falls on the floor. As soon as his body hit the ground, Jennings and his boys just jumped on Sammy. They are beating him terribly. Sammy said the beating was so bad he thought his life was gonna end. He thought that was gonna be the end of his life right there. He thought they were gonna beat him to death. And when these guys saw the fear in Sammy's eyes, they took full advantage of the situation in the worst way. They stopped beating him, they stood him up, and they told him to dance. Dance, boy. Dance for your life. If you don't, we'll kill you. And baby, Sammy say he went to dancing, child. He just dancing, you know what I'm saying? He just hopping, just dancing for his life. And Sammy said he was humiliated the whole time he was tapping and you know, ah, 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 you know, I don't know what he was doing, but I definitely 
definitely would have been doing all of that. So I'm guessing he was doing all of that and he did say he was humiliated by it, but he was scared. And a lot of people probably judge Sammy off of that, just like they probably just judged me because I said I would be dancing, but I don't care. I don't care. When it comes to my life, just like Sammy probably thought about his life, child, now, it might be some things that are worth it to lose your life for, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people act like, you know, pride, dignity is worth it to lose your life for. And I agree. Absolutely, I agree. But under the right circumstances, the right circumstances is somebody like Martin Luther King or, you know, other civil leaders who died for what they believe in standing up for people. It was the right circumstances because they were in a public eye. It was worldwide. Everybody knew. Being in a bad Room, surrounded by your enemies is not the right circumstances. So let's say Sammy didn't do any dances. Let's say these guys beat him to death. Sammy is in heaven and he's like, you know, yes, you know, I died, I gave my life for my pride, my dignity, I stood up for something. Then next thing you know, a newspaper comes out the next day, the headline, a uh, great entertainer, Sammy Davis Jr. got caught robbing somebody. Next thing you know, they had to kill him in the bathroom. So that's what I mean. When nobody is there to see it, there are no open eyes on you to know why you died. You are risking the chance to have your story written by the victor, by your killer, and they can write anything after you die. And this is not just white on black crime and racial crime and all this kind of stuff. Whoever, you know what I'm saying? It pertains to everybody. There's no need to sit up there and give your life, especially if you are not on a world stage, or even if you don't even have to be on the world stage. At least your family or somebody need to know why you have given your life. But anyways, that's my personal opinion. Let's move on. So like I was saying before, this guy Jennings gave Sammy Davis Jr. the worst time of his life. And so it comes down to one day Jennings is just looking at Sammy. You know what I'm saying? And he kind of like he got some compassion in his eye, you know? And Sammy notices this too. And then Jennings, I'm guessing, just kind of shakes his head like, you know, man, we've been doing you wrong. This ain't right. He goes and gets a bottle of beer and he comes and he sits beside Sammy and he's like, here, hey, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry for what we've been doing to you. Here's this bottle of beer. You know, basically, can we be friends? And Sammy is like, uh, I don't know where this is coming from, but yes, you know what I'm saying? Thank God that you're seeing that you guys have been doing me wrong. And he accepts the bottle of beer that's offered to him and he's about to drink it, but he notices that this bottle of beer should be ice cold. So why the heck is it warm? Matter of fact, it's almost hot. And so he tilts it up, sniffs it, looks over at Jennings, and when he does, this Jennings. Try not to laugh because, honey, it is urine that he has put in that beer bottle. Baby, he is trying to make Sammy Davis Jr. drink his pee. Luckily, Sammy noticed that and he does not drink it. So, you know, Sammy was going through hell in this military. But luckily, it was not his entire military career because soon after this beer bottle incident, I'm guessing, they moved Sammy from the branch that he was in to a special services branch. The special services branch was for entertainers. And this was a great relief for Sammy. He gets into this branch and immediately he starts doing what he love and that is performing and everything looks great for Sammy Davis Jr. That is until he gets on a stage and he's out there, he's dancing and performing and he sees the face of Jennings as well as everyone else that bullied him in the audience looking at him. Now, Sammy does say that he put on a great performance that night, you know, and he actually kind of wowed these guys, but, you know, who cares if you're saying wow and you all happy that I'm dancing and stuff now? Who cares if that is genuine? What you did to me was terrible, so it takes me to put on a show for me to be accepted, and unfortunately, it did, and this stuck with Sammy for the rest of his life. It took him to put on a show to be accepted. So, in 1945, Sammy is finally discharged from the military, and even though he went through all of that brutality he still ended up earning the american campaign medal and the world war ii victory medal and with those two medals under his belt he was discharged with the rank of private and i am sure that sammy was elated overjoyed to be back with his father and will master and even better he also was a full grown man now honey and then chose to have a little muscle mass on his little skinny frame you know what i'm saying so this made his dancing even better now it was nothing to do these high kicks, these flips, you know, these high jumps and toe touches and stuff. It was nothing for him to do that. And with his high energy and the fact that his father and Will Maston were getting older, there was without a doubt now that Sammy was the star of the show, period. And since this is the case, like it does for many other people on my old Hollywood scandalous list, the word about Sammy Davis Jr. and his magnificent performances 
start to travel very fast. And when word travels like this, you all know what happened. The venues start to get more and more full. Then they get to the point where people are standing up just to catch a sight of this fantastic young man. Now, by 1949, people thought that Sammy's catchy singing voice was good enough to be put on record. And Sammy thought so too, well, uh, kind of. He didn't want anybody to know it was him, so he changed his name for the record, and he actually recorded under the moniker Shorty Muggin. Now, these records were not bad, but they really didn't go anywhere, though. And probably the reason that they didn't go anywhere is because Sammy was singing blues on these records. He would later find out that his voice could sell millions of records if he was singing pop songs. Now, throughout the 1950s, Sammy continues to perform with the Will Maston Trio. His presence is demanded more and more. People are continuously blown away by how quick on his feet this guy is, how light on his feet this guy is. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when Sammy performed at a show, he was not the headliner. The Will Maston Trio were not the headliner. There were other headliners. But those headliners sometimes had to wait 20, 30, 40, even sometimes a full hour to get to the stage because the audience kept kept asking for an encore from Sammy Davis Jr. That's just how good he was. Then in 1953, ABC offered Sammy Davis Jr. his own TV show. This show is called Three for the Road. Then in 1954, his profile continues to grow when he is hired to sing the title song for the film, Six Bridges to Cross. If you do not know what this all means, this means that Sammy Davis Jr. was doing hit stage shows, new TV show, music starting to get more and more successful, so much so that he has been asked to record a staple song for a movie. Oh yes, baby, there is no mistaking about it. Sammy Davis Jr. is on his high horse, honey. He's just riding into the sunset, you hear me? And he's just a galloping child, and all of a sudden the arrow come, hits him in the back, and knocks him off of that horse. Baby, the horse still riding to the sunset, Sammy Davis Jr. laid on the ground crying, child. And y'all laughing about this, but this was literal. He really was laying on the ground crying because, see, in 1954, that was also the year that he had his horrific, horrific car accident. It all happened on November the 19th. And Sammy was driving from Las Vegas to Los Angeles, and he is just chilling behind the wheel, honey, probably thinking about all his success and everything. And then suddenly, a lady who clearly was not looking for oncoming traffic backs out into the middle of the highway. Sammy has absolutely no time to react and he runs into the back of this lady's car. When they collided, gossip says it was so hard that Sammy's car ended up flipping. And I don't know if that is true, but I do know that during the violent incident, Sammy's head lurched forward like this and the horn that was shaped like a bullet at the time went directly into his left eye socket. And it said that Sammy didn't even notice the pain at first because his adrenaline and everything was so high, but when when everything settled, he started to feel a searing pain reverberating through his head starting at his left eye. When he reached up to hold or feel his eye to his horror, all he felt was a long string coming from his eye. Then I'm sure he noticed that this was no ordinary string. This string was wet and it was fleshy. And as Sammy traveled his finger down the length of the string, at the end of it he felt an eyeball. That's right, this horrific accident had caused Sammy's left eye to pop out of the socket. And that was bad, yes that was terrible, but it became even more terrible when he was rushed to the hospital and they told him that they could not save the eye. Now rumor has it after this car accident, Sammy Davis Jr. went through a deep depression. First of all, he blamed himself for the accident because he felt like if he had been wearing his holy relic, his mezuzah on his necklace like he usually does, this accident would have never happened. Secondly, he kind of worried about his looks a little bit because see, what many people don't know is that Sammy Davis Jr. had a complex about his looks anyway. It is said that he would call himself ugly, you know what I'm saying? He really didn't feel like he looked the best. So now he felt like, you know, who gonna want this skinny little ugly dude, you know what I'm saying? And I got one eye. So he was fighting with that. But outside of his looks and his social life, nothing bothered him more than him being worried about his career. And this made him depressed and sad just to think about what would happen to him. Would people still support him? Would they still want to see him? But what Sammy didn't know is that he would not have to worry about any of this. During that six months, he went through his recovery just fine. You know, he got his balance back. He got his dancing shoes back, light on his feet. And also, instead of hurting his career, this car wreck 
helped his career tremendously because he got so much press. Before the accident, he was known as a great entertainer, Mr. Sammy Davis Jr., but after the accident, this man was a superstar. And when Sammy realized this, all of the press, everybody who had all these questions for him, everybody who wanted to see him, he took full advantage of this. And he got back on stage and started performing like he was brand new, honey. And child, some folks thought that eye patch was finna stop him. Baby, that eye patch ain't stop nothing, child. Sammy got on stage with that doggone eye patch. Sammy did his dances with that eye patch. Sammy even shot a photo for an album cover with that eye patch. Child, Sammy said, you ain't stopping my money. And all of this goodness, all of this success gave Sammy great relief. And so he continued just climbing, climbing, climbing up those Hollywood ranks. So just to sum up the 1950s for Sammy Davis Jr., they were a great time for him. Like I said, he went from a great entertainer to a superstar. And when I say superstar, baby, I mean the man came into himself, honey, because guess what? This man was getting paid $25,000 a week. And the thing is, that was just the beginning because right at the end of the 1950s, in fact, 1959, Sammy Davis Jr. had joined the Rat Pack. And that's when he was really made. And from here on out, Sammy was just shooting, shooting, shooting. So now, honey, y'all know what time it is, honey. It is time to get to the scandal, child. The scandal. Let's get to it. The first rumor says that when Sammy was a little bitty boy and he started dancing with his father and Will Mastin, a lot of times they would put him in blackface and call him a 40 year old midget named Silent Sam. And it said the reason they did this is because they were trying to bypass the laws that said it was illegal for a person under 16 to perform on stage. The next rumor is a build up on what I said about Sammy Davis Jr. thinking that he was ugly. It is claimed that he did indeed think he was ugly, but Sammy knew how to make himself look good. He felt like he could make himself as attractive as he wanted to be through his style, you know what I'm saying? Through his dance, his charisma, by being smooth. And it, it worked. It's claimed that many women thought Sammy Davis Jr. was the most sexy man on the planet. And baby, he could sling them down on the bed naked just by looking at them, honey. You know what I'm saying? The man had it going on to a lot of women. But even though it did work for him with the women, it is claimed that it did bother Sammy that he was not attractive. In fact, it said that his feelings were so hurt when a guy named Bob Sylvester, who was an editor for the Daily Mail or a columnist or something like that, he basically wrote a column and was like, you know, that's Sammy Davis Jr. My, he can dance, but God hit that boy in the face with a shovel. He's so ugly or something like that. And when Sammy read this, this hurt his feelings. This next rumor says that Sammy was one of the fastest draws in Hollywood. Like he could draw a weapon just like this. So honey, he started to bring that into his stage performance, okay? Well, child, listen to this. Don't you know that they said Sammy was on stage with a loaded gun, or I don't know if it was blanks or whatever, but whatever the case, he tried to do the quick draw, but he couldn't draw it quick enough and pulled the trigger on himself, girl. The bullet skimmed his leg and took off a chunk of his calf muscle, baby. So Sammy didn't holler, didn't scream or nothing. He was just like, ugh. You know, and he kept on performing and dancing, whatever, but he was whispering to the person on stage with him, hey, get a doctor, get a doctor, I've shot myself. Now, this next bit of tea says that Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. were indeed good friends and that Frank Sinatra worked hard to open doors for Sammy Davis Jr., but it is claimed that there is a flip side to that friendship. Child, don't you know there's some folks out here saying that there was some jealousy in that friendship and it came from both ends? The first thing says that Sammy looked up to Frank Sinatra, okay? Frank Sinatra was like one of Sammy Davis is Jr.'s idols, all right? But Sammy also felt a jealousy towards him because he felt like he was just as good, if not better, than Frank Sinatra. And he hated the way, you know, Frank Sinatra could just do what he wanted to do. You know what I'm saying? He was the biggest man in Hollywood, you know, the biggest man. And Sammy Davis Jr. hated that. That made him very jealous. He was envious because it was like, you know, Frank Sinatra got this white skin, so it's so easy for him. And it's also said that Frank Sinatra was a little bit jealous of Sammy Davis Jr. He felt like Sammy Davis Jr. was very good. He wanted to dance like Sammy Davis Jr. He wanted to be able to walk on air and wanted to be able to tap and all that kind of stuff just like Sammy Davis Jr. Basically wanted to be a great entertainer like Sammy Davis Jr. was and he did not have the chops for it. And then this next rumor says that sometimes Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. would get into it so bad that they wouldn't talk, okay? But they said it was more of Frank Sinatra cutting Sammy Davis Jr. off. He would go through these mood swings and these long periods of times where he just wanted to kind of be to himself 
himself, but gossip says that that was just Frank Sinatra anyway. That it wasn't only with Sammy Davis Jr. He was like that with a lot of people, you know. He just was like moody, you know what I'm saying? He'd be cool one moment, then the next moment, it was kind of like he got an attitude. And people kind of knew to distance themselves from Frank Sinatra when he was like this. But y'all listen to this, baby. I know that they say that he was like this with everybody, but child, it probably was a reason he was doing this with Sammy Davis Jr. Because listen to this, child. Gossip says that Sammy Davis Jr. slept with Ava Gardner. Mm-hmm, girl. That's right. They said he slept with Ava Gardner. And, honey, if this is true, that's probably why Frank Sinatra was ticked off at Sammy Davis Jr. Because everybody knows that Frank Sinatra loved Ava Gardner's dirty drawers, honey. He would drink her bath water. He loved her so much. So it probably really bothered him that Sammy Davis Jr. slept with her. And it is claimed that when Sammy Davis Jr. did sleep with her, he and Frank Sinatra were not even friends. They were not even in the same circle. But Frank probably didn't care about that. He probably didn't care if he didn't even know Ava Gardner at the time. It still probably bothered him that Sammy Davis Jr. had slept with the woman that he loved. Speaking of the women, honey, don't you know the tea out on these Hollywood streets said that Sammy Davis Jr. slept with a whole heap of them, honey. Black, white, and every other color that you can name. Sammy Davis Jr. was whipping that thing out and laying them down, honey. And now let's get into one of the biggest names of all that he messed with. Miss Kim Novak. So the year is 1957 and Kim Novak has recently been chosen to be Harry Kahn's new blonde. And since this is the case, Harry Kahn puts Kim through the Hollywood machine. And y'all know which machine I'm talking about. The same one they put Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield through. Told her to lose 15 pounds, cut her hair, dye her hair blonde, and start wearing little bitty skin tight dresses that she basically had to pour herself into. And so Kim has done that and now she is the newest Hollywood blonde bombshell. And also at this time, she was Hollywood's top box office draw. And so to get back to the story, Sammy is performing at Chicago's hottest nightclub, the Chess Paris. And baby, they say that Sammy was smooth that night, honey. They say he walked out on stage and it was still dark, you know what I'm saying? All you could see was his cufflinks shining and he had his like sleeves rolled up, you know, had on his little white shirt. And they said he was kind of just sitting on the stool, you know, and he had a little cigarette in his hand. And so you can see the smoke like billowing, you know, like the silhouette. You know what I'm saying? He was smooth, brother was smooth, you know what I mean? So anyways, then the lights shine on him, and when it does, he just comes to life. He's just dancing, doing his tapping, and, you know, tilting his head, and, you know, Sammy just got it going on. And the people that witnessed this performance said the performance was electrifying. You know, they said it was almost a sexual nature. The way he just kind of was moving his body and his fingers, everything was detailed, all right? So anyways, while he's doing this, he is making eyes, very sexy eyes, to the corner of the stage at a table sitting beside the stage. It was because at that table sat Miss Kim Novak. And so after this performance, Kim and Sammy did meet, you know what I'm saying? They kind of flirted a little bit, but Gossip says that they did not hit it off right at that point. In fact, they didn't really hit it off like that until Gossip Columns of the Day started putting out little columns like, you know, ooh, or Sammy Davis Jr. and Kim Novak, are they dating? And so it said that once they started reading these columns and, you know, it kind of made it a forbidden love in the columns that it made it more exciting for them. They got excited about dating, so that is when they kind of hit it off because it made their romance, um, you know, daring. You know what I'm saying? Kind of when people know they're not supposed to do something, it makes it more exciting. So they really got it on. And when I say they got it on, baby, they got it on. It even got to the point where Sammy was sneaking in the back of people's cars up under a rug so the car could take him to Kim Novak's room or her house or wherever she was so they could get it on and the paparazzi didn't see them. And at first, the relationship was really just Sammy putting the hammer on Kim. But soon it became a lot more. They started talking about each other's feelings. They started to see that they shared some of the same interests. And then for Sammy, it really became serious. He had actually fallen in love with Kim Novak, and they were really and truly spending a lot of time together. It was almost like Kim Novak became Sammy Davis Jr.'s fix. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was not himself until he could see her, until he could spend time with her. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that one night, Sammy Davis Jr. was supposed to perform at the Sands Hotel. Well, he wanted to miss that performance. Instead, he wanted to leave where he was at, Las Vegas, and fly back to Kim Novak's house. I think she was in California 
California, Chicago, or New York. But anyways, he wanted to profess his undying love for her. He wanted to let her know, I love you, baby. Kim, would you be mine? And Frank Sinatra was like, no, you have a show to do. You're not gonna miss this because you wanna get up under Kim Novak. No, we're not having that. So Sammy Davis Jr. became very dramatic. There was a friend there with him. Don't you know he like got on his knees to this friend and started crying and just welling and telling this friend, please, please go fly to Kim's house and tell her that I love her. Tell her that she's everything to me. And the friend is like, Sammy, I am not about to get on a plane to go and spend five minutes telling this woman that you love her. And Sammy is just like, devastated i mean he keeps crying rolling on the floor everything child and finally this friend said okay okay i will do it and he flew to wherever kim novak was and told her sammy loves you and he wants to be with you forever you may be wondering like why was sammy davis jr doing all this why couldn't he just pick up the phone and tell her that well gossip says the reason he couldn't pick up the phone is because kim novak was in the house with her family and the family only had one phone line so he was scared that if he called somebody else would pick up the phone and be on the phone listening to them and there's no way that he could be talking to Kim Novak in a romantic way and definitely not professing his love for her. So anyways, that rumor just lets you know just how far and just how deep their affair had become. And as it got more and more strong, a lot of tongues started wagging. This was not just gossip columns like it used to be. This tea was being spilled by people that were in their inner circle. And it seems like these people were probably haters. But whoever the people were, they definitely had loose lips and they were giving details of Kim's and Sammy's relationship. And because this was happening before long, almost all of Hollywood knew about it. Definitely the other actors and actresses. And when some stars got wind of it, they got nasty, honey. Let's take Milton Burrow, for example. Gossip says that he was using the bathroom at the same time Sammy Davis Jr. was using the bathroom. And Milton Burrow, who was urinating and who was famous for having a huge dazunga, he is urinating beside Sammy Davis Jr. And he nudged Sammy. He was like, hey, Sammy get a load of this, talking about his stuff. And he was like, I tell you what, you better hope Kim Novak never sees this because if she do, you'll be back to sleeping with Hattie McDaniel. Basically telling Sammy that he would get Kim and Sammy would have to go back to the black women. But here's the thing, none of that mattered. Sammy was so in love with Kim, he was willing to put up with all of this gossip and he was willing to put up with these nasty remarks. But the problem was is that definitely was not all he had to put up with. You see, word had now reached far and wide and it had effect effectively reach the ears of the studio head. And one of the studio heads that it got to was the aforementioned Harry Kahn. And when Harry Kahn found out that his newly made top box office draw, Blunt, was dating a black man, he blew his top, honey. I mean, the man yelled so loud that baby, my great aunts and uncles down in Alabama heard him scream. And he basically took on the attitude that if anybody found out that Kim Novak was dating a black man, she would not sell tickets anymore to these movies. And if anybody thought they were about to play with his money, Oh, baby, they were out of their rabbit tail mind. So Gossip says Harry put someone on Kim's case. They started following her, almost stalking her, just to check and see if the rumors were true. And while this is happening, Sammy and Kim have no idea. They still think they are being very successful with their sneaking around. That is until one day when Sammy Davis Jr. gets a phone call. When Sammy picks up the phone, the voice that he hears is his father's voice. And his father is very panicked. You know, he's talking very fast. And so Sammy is like, Daddy, Daddy, wait, Dad. Hold on, slow down, tell me what you're trying to say. And his father, shaking with fear, finally blurts out, they're gonna kill you, Sammy. And Sammy is like, what? What are you talking about, Dad? And his father is like, yes, son. Mickey Cohen just cornered me in a park not too long ago. He told me that he's been given orders to break both of your legs and put your other eye out. Son, if you don't stop messing with that white girl, son, they're gonna take your life away from you. And then Sammy is just kind of sitting there and he's processing what he's hearing. And his father is like, listen, son, Mickey made me a deal. Mickey said that he would call all of this off if you hurry up and find a black girl to marry within the next 24 to 48 hours. And Sammy is like, but, and his daddy's like, no but, son, find you a black girl. And with that, the phone line goes dead. And so Sammy is just kind of sitting there and he doesn't know what to say. He's actually in shock. And then a man by the name of Arthur Silver, who was in the room with Sammy at the time, finally breaks the silence. And he's like, what are we gonna do? Because he even heard Sammy's father over the phone. And Arthur is completely beside himself because a threat from Mickey Cohen is not just an idle threat. Mickey Cohen was a notorious gangster and he was known for putting heads on spikes pretty much. 
much. And Arthur is so shaken up. He's so scared that he is like pacing and all this kind of stuff. And Sammy is just like, wait up, hold on, hold on. Just calm down, calm down. And Sammy was scared, but also you think he ain't made no friends while he been in this business? And so before Sammy starts to panic, he picks up the phone, he dialed a number and he asked for the doctor. And the doctor was none other than Sam Giancana, another very notorious gangster. And so when Sam Giancana gets on the phone, Sammy starts telling him all the details. He gives them the rundown of what's happening. And he's like, Sam, I need your protection. You know, please send your goons, have somebody to protect me. And that's when Sam Giancana tells Sammy, hey, Sammy, if you were in Chicago or Las Vegas, we could protect you, but we have no authority and no reach into Hollywood. That is the territory of Mickey Cohen. And this time when Sammy hung up the phone, he was shaking in his boots. He got up and he went to his address book and he just started flipping through the pages. I mean, he is flipping like crazy. And Arthur Silver is like, what are you doing? Do you know another gangster to call? Or you know, what are you trying to do? And Sammy is like, no, I ain't looking for no doggone gangster. I'm looking for a black woman, didn't you hear it? I have to find a black woman to marry within 24 to 48 hours, I have to find one. So he's just flipping. And now although obviously Sammy was not going Going to be in love with this black woman he was choosing he definitely was not trying to choose no mess okay you know what i'm saying he wasn't gonna have no anybody just on his arm so when he's flipping he's actively looking and thinking of the details of the lady and what they look like and things like that and finally his finger landed on a name and that was Miss Loray White. Miss Loray White was a very spectacular looking, very smart, very well spoken, twice married, 23 year old who was a dancer and who had a six year old son. And when Sammy called Loray and she answered the phone, he did not waste any time. He told her to get over to his suite right then. And when she does get there, Sammy sits her right down and tells her, you know, baby, you are looking good today. And Loray is like, <laughs> Well, Sammy, thank you. And then Sammy is like, I want you to marry me. And when Lorray kind of stutters a little bit, Sammy is like, okay, listen, I know, I know. We're not in love. I'm springing this on you. So let me just make it interesting for you. And Gossip says that he offered her some amount of money. Some people say about $10,000 and tells her straight up, hey, I want you to marry me. I will give you this lump sum of money and we will stay married for a year and then we will divorce. And Gossip says that Lorray White was like, okay, cool. After this whole thing with Lorray White, it is said the next day or the day after that at one of Sammy's shows at the Sands Hotels, he announces that he is getting married to the love of his life. And they did indeed get married. In fact, it is claimed that on their wedding day, Loray was about 40 minutes late for the ceremony, which was only two minutes. And afterwards, there were all kind of handshakes and pats on the backs and just congratulations all around. And Sammy Davis Jr. played the part of a happy husband that was in love with his bride to a T at first but then he started drinking more and more and his true feelings kind of started to show luckily people had started leaving by that time as everyone was leaving though sammy continued to drink his sorrow away and finally loray is like hey sammy don't you think we need to be headed back to the suite and sammy is like uh, you know what Come on, you're right, let's go. And so when they are on their way to the suite, I imagine that Sammy is like, you know what, I can't be with Kim, but this is a beautiful lady beside me. And so somewhere along the way, he starts grabbing Loray and they start kissing, okay? And his hand is on her back and then it moves up to the back of her head, you know, stroking her. And then it moves to her face. He's caressing her, you know, they kissing real good. And then suddenly his hands move to her neck He's stroking her neck. And then, baby, next thing you know, this Lorray. Uh, 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 child, yes, baby. Gossip says that Sammy Davis Jr. started choking that woman. What kind of serial killer mess is going on here? Child, I don't know. But I'm guessing as he was strangling her, maybe Lorray was about to black out or something. And her struggling got less and less. And so he stopped. And I don't know what happened after this. I'm not even sure how he explained this. You know what I mean? But I do know that at the end of the night, Laura Ray went up to the suite by herself and Sammy went into another room. And baby, as soon as Sammy got into the room, honey, he took out his gun, put it to his head and threatened to commit suicide. And then he broke down crying like a baby. I mean, he was just sobbing, just. <laughs> and it said that he yelled out in despair. 
Why can't I be with the woman that I love? But here's the thing though, while Sammy's sitting up there doing all that rolling and crying and stuff like that, Gossip says that he was definitely still with the woman that he loved even after this episode. You see, about 24 to 48 hours after Sammy got married, he got a call from one of the gangsters or somebody who told him, hey Sammy, look, the heat is off. So you ain't got to worry about us picking you up and breaking your legs and stuff like that. And then a little bit after this, Sam started back seeing Kim Novak. And even though they were being more secretive and nobody really knew about this, it is claimed that he was messing with Kim Novak and seeing her just as much, pretty much, as he was before this whole thing popped off. Apparently, it got so bad how much time he was spending with her that even though Lorraine White agreed to this marriage under those pretenses, she still found herself getting a little bit jealous. And Gossip says that Sammy had put her up in a big, huge, beautiful house up in the Hollywood Hills, and then it's all also said that Lorraine went on all type of shopping sprees and Chai they said that girl was spending all Sammy money Chai. But anyway, so she definitely was living her life. But in the end, it is claimed that she still kind of wanted a relationship with her husband. She was Mrs. Sammy Davis Jr., you know? And I'm not sure if she thought like, you know, I can marry him and make him love me. I'm not sure what that was about. But apparently just the fact that she married him, put an energy in her where she wanted some kind of connection with her husband. You know what I'm saying? She maybe wanted to sleep with him sometimes. You know, she wanted something. And this affected her so bad that the old Hollywood street says that she called the wife of a friend of Sammy's and she was just on the phone, just a bawling baby, just sobbing. And she was telling this friend that, yes, I'm Mrs. Sammy Davis Jr., but it don't feel like it because he spends all of his time with Kim. So, you know, this really hurt her feelings. And not only was this affecting Laura Ray White, it is something else that was affecting Laura Ray White. It was the fact that a lot of people had got in her ear and was like, yes, you know, if you marry Sammy, you know, your career goes sky high. You'll be shooting for the stars. You will be Mrs. Sammy Davis Jr., baby. Why come that girl career ain't go nowhere? She didn't get no movies, no commercial. Honey, that girl didn't even get a doggone skit, child. Her career didn't go nowhere. But all of that stuff I just mentioned about Lorraine White, girl, Sammy ain't cared not one bit. Sammy was too busy, laid up with Kim Novak to care about what Lorraine had going on. He was living his best life. But see, what Sammy didn't know is that Kim Novak was kind of coming off of the high of being with him. Yeah, it was all fun and good and exciting at first, but see, now things had changed, child. Harry Kahn found out that she and Sammy were still seeing each other, and he told her the worst words that she had ever heard. Baby, he told her if she continued to see Sammy Davis Jr., he would do to her career what he did to Rita Hayworth's career. And let me tell you why these words bothered Kim Novak so bad. It was because Harry Kahn did indeed destroy Rita Hayworth's career. He stopped giving her good movie roles. He stopped giving her good fanfare. He started letting the negative talk and negative gossip in magazines get printed everywhere. So he effectively definitely destroyed Rita Hayworth's career. And another reason why those words meant so much to Kim Novak is because Kim Novak knew that the only reason that she was turned into the blonde bombshell was because she was the replacement for Rita Hayworth. Yes, Kim's whole career was because Harry Kahn wanted to teach Rita Hayworth a lesson and Kim Novak knew that most people considered Rita Hayworth to be a much better actress than Kim Novak. Rita Hayworth knew how to dance, she knew how to sing, she was an all around entertainer. So if Harry Kahn could destroy Rita Hayworth's career, a woman with much more support and much more fanfare than Kim Novak, imagine what he could do to Kim's career. Oh so yeah, she liked Sammy, you know what I'm saying? Maybe even loved him, but baby, she ain't loving that dog on much. She wanted to hold on to her star power. She wanted to hold on to that spotlight. So before you knew it, Sammy would be calling her and she would stop answering so much, you know what I'm saying? She would stop being so available to him. And then soon communication between the two just straight up dried up. Rumor has it Sammy was definitely heartbroken by this, but eventually he had to give up on Miss Kim Novak and he had to move on. But even though Sammy and Kim Novak's little relationship had dried up, that did not mean that he fell in love with Lorraine White. So it said their marriage didn't even last a whole six or nine months, one of those two, um, and they got divorced very quickly. But Lorraine White did end up getting an extra $25,000 out of Sammy Davis Jr. due to that union. Now regarding Sammy and white women, and I'm not saying this to turn this into a racial video, which of course it already is anyway, but I'm saying this because this is part of the gossip because a man named Bert 
Boyer said that Sammy said to him, man, I just kept on getting all this hate. You know what I'm saying? White people kept on treating me any kind of way. So I felt like, let me get the biggest, best, and baddest white girl and let me have her on my arm and just kind of let the world know, you know what I'm saying? Hey, yeah, look, what you think I'm doing with her? Basically, you know, to get back at white people. Now that's what Bert Boyer said. Other people around the time said that Sammy wasn't trying to get back at anybody. He slept with white women and wanted white women because he wanted to ingratiate himself into white society. He wanted to be accepted by white people. And people said that he would really go through any lengths to try to get that respect or at least kind of be treated on the same level as these people, even if it meant that Sammy was the butt of the joke. And I say this because like I said, in 1959, he became a part of the Rat Pack, but even though he was a part of the Rat Pack, but a lot of their jokes they made were at the expense of Sammy. They would do little jokes like, you know, oh, Sammy didn't see you there, I thought you were the hell. Or, you know, even they said they had one joke where they were like, Sammy, you get the ashtray, basically telling him to get the ashtray because if the ashes got on his black skin, nobody would notice. So Sammy is always the butt of the joke. It hurt him, but he felt like this is what he had to do to be accepted by these people. Also, it said that he felt like he owed Frank Sinatra. Frank had did a lot of favors for this guy, so he couldn't just blow up on stage and go, pow, punch Frank Sinatra in the face. And really the whole thing just boils down to Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin just doing too much. Now, as I've already told you, Frank Sinatra had a lot of pull and he did get Sammy a whole bunch of gigs, got him around people that Sammy would have never been around, got Sammy to come to these high society flashy parties but gossip says even though sammy was at these parties there was still a lot of times that he was treated like he was less than for example one party is a dinner party okay everybody is sitting around the table all right and the chefs come around and they all sit the platters down in front of the people and they're lifting the tops off y'all know that fancy schmancy stuff you know and so when they're lifting the top off everybody has lobster you know so everybody's like "Ooh, smells so good and they go down the road Ooh, yes lobster lobster you you know, everybody acting a fool. And then they lift Sammy's plate. Child, why come his fried chicken on that doggone plate? Sammy couldn't do nothing but laugh at all. But hey, listen, guess what? I would have had some fun that doggone chef. I would have took my chicken and I would have bit down in it and I would have been like, mmm. <laughs> I say, Walter, this is pink. Yeah, the chicken. Hey, hey, guess what? The chicken is undone. Please take this away from me. You know what I'm saying? Don't play with me, baby, because I would embarrass the doggone shit. But anyway, to get back to Sammy, he is dealing with a lot of mental strife at this time because he's struggling with his blackness and then struggling with his career. So it is now the 1960s. Sammy is still a part of the Rat Pack. And as far as a black entertainer or even just a regular entertainer, his career is steady, soaring higher and higher. And he really wants somebody to share this with. And it comes in the form of a pretty blonde actress named My Brit. Now, my Brit was born over in Sweden and Sweden did not have racism like the United States. So when Mai figured out that she liked Sammy and Sammy liked her, she didn't have any problems. She had no qualms about getting with Sammy Davis Jr. But child, check this out. It did not matter if Mai wasn't born in the U.S. Every other white person around Sammy Davis Jr. was born in the U.S. And baby, when they saw Mai Brit, they did not want Sammy's blackety chocolate lips kissing all over that white woman. But Sammy wasn't the only one being called names, honey. Child, next thing you know, Ma was sitting up there being called thin whitey lips. They ain't want her lips on him because rumor says that black people and white people were upset at this union. See, black people had no idea about Sammy Davis Jr. and Kim Novak because that was a huge secret. But now Sammy Davis Jr. had actually married a white woman. So yes, the black and white communities were up in arms and they were calling both of them names. But regardless of whatever names they were called and all this mess they had to go through, it did not matter. Sammy and Mai loved each other and they did get married. And in 1961, they had a daughter and her name Name was Tracy. They also adopted two sons, Mark and Jeff, and they lived in a wedded bliss, but it was too bad that the bliss was only in their household because honey, the racist abuse that Sammy had to endure after he married my Brit was just overwhelming. And now people were actively showing up at his shows threatening him, sending him all kind of hate mail. People threatened to shoot him where he stood. And as much as Sammy probably wanted to just throw the towel in, you know what I'm saying, and live in bliss inside of his castle, he could not because Sammy had a lot of debt. So he had to keep working. But the outside world did not know about this debt. As far as they saw, Sammy's career was still doing very well. And he was now making movies, honey. And I'm not talking about no B list movies like the ones he had did with Earth the Kid. And we are talking about A list movies with A list cast. 
Sammy Davis Jr. was now in the stratosphere. Honey, he started feeling himself, child. Since he was big time, he wanted to mentor everybody. You know what I'm saying? Help the up and coming actors and singers and stuff like that. And most of them were female. And then there was this one gorgeous, very beautiful female that he mentored. And Sammy couldn't help but get a piece of that, honey. Her name was Lola Falana. And I'm not going to go very deep into their relationship because I've already described their relationship in the actual Lola Falana Otis Redding video. But I am gonna tell you that yes, it is said that Sammy Davis Jr. definitely started cheating on his wife Mai with Lola Falana all the time. And child, his tail just a humping, humping, humping. He's doing so much that finally Mai found out about it. And in 1968, she finally confronted him with the information and Sammy Davis Jr. confessed. He admitted that he had been sleeping with Lola Falana and Ma divorced his little behind. And the bad thing about this is after Ma left him, he found out that Lola didn't want to have nothing else to do with him either. Child, she started to leave him alone too. So yeah, Sammy had messed all the way up. And Gossip says that the fact that he had messed all the way up made Sammy deeply affected by his divorce. He even almost became despondent and kind of just tried to throw his life away. For one, he turned to and got on alcohol and cocaine heavily and for two he immersed himself into pornographic material but get this though the T says that not only was Sammy watching pornos that he was actively involved in the pornos like he was on the set of pornos sitting up there having a helping hand when it came to shooting porno he was trying his best to become a part of the dark side of Hollywood the underbelly of Hollywood and with this it is time to get into a little more scandal honey and whoop cha. This one right here is messy, 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 baby. Now, child, listen at this. Now, first of all, you see how I'm trying to tell you that Sammy tries to become a part of the dark side of Hollywood? Baby, why come his folks out here talking about some Sammy was a devil worshiper, honey? Said that Sammy had turned his life over to Satan. Baby, he even joined the church of Satan. As a matter of fact, it is said that Eddie Murphy said one day he talked to Sammy Davis Jr. And Sammy just kind of blurted out, you know, like, oh, serving the devil is just like serving God. Something like that. And child Eddie was like, and then y'all listen to this. So you know how I told you that Sammy Davis Jr. had become immersed in pornography? Well, honey, get close to the screen and put your ear up, honey. Because, baby, I got some of the deepest tea that I've ever heard on Sammy Davis Jr. Honey, don't you know that Linda Loveless, the woman who starred in one of the first porno movies, Deep Throat, said that she was at her house with her husband, okay? And Sammy Davis Jr. was at the house with them. They were showing Linda Loveless a bunch of short video clips of women doing deep throat motions. You know what I'm saying? And so Linda was trying to know her husband but she kept failing okay every time she went to you know what I'm saying she kept gagging and so Sammy and her husband was like no you know that's not it try it this way she tried that she would fail and child listen I guess Sammy got sick of it or something but rumor says that Sammy jumped up and was like no 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 Linda that's not it you know just scoot over baby don't you know he scooched her behind over said that he got down in front of her husband and he showed her what's good honey said Sammy was doing the throaty body like a goaty child said that he was the goat because baby they said that he didn't let one drip fall of the aftermath from Linda Loveless husband. I know I done told y'all honey this old Hollywood scandalous tea is the hottest tea around. Now let's move on because this is just a mess. So yes gossip says that that happened. I don't know if it's true but it is said that Linda Loveless wrote that in her book. So child take that how you want to take it. But I do know that it is claimed that in the late 60s and early 70s that Sammy Davis Jr. was out here doing too much girl. They said he skipping scooped up hair was doing the most and listen to this rumor so in 1968 he meets Altavis Gore okay she would eventually go on to be his wife but right now he's just meeting her and they start dating immediately rumor has it he is still married to his wife Maya at this time they have not divorced yet not only is he supposedly still married to Maya he's also still messing with Lola Falana so he is messing with all three of these women okay well child check this out remember I told y'all that rumor in the Lola Falana video the one about him and Lola or him him and Altavis being at his house, okay? They're upstairs, they are getting it on. All of a sudden, there is a knock on the door at the bottom of the house. Sammy goes to answer it, and it's either Lolo or Altavis. Whichever the case, both of these women were supposedly in the house together. So he basically had a woman at the bottom level of the house and the top level of the house. And don't you know they say he took care of both of them? <laughs> hey, listen, 
putting it down like a Mac around town, baby. But listen, the thing about it is that gossip says that Alta Vise knew Sammy was messy, honey, when she first met him because it is said that when she met him and he came on to her, she told him, hmm, I heard they call you the carpenter. And when Sammy was like, why? She said, because you nail every woman you meet. But I tell you one thing she probably didn't know. Let me tell you about this. So he and Alta Vise do get married in 1971. And child, they said Sammy started acting a complete donkey said that he was still getting very high on these drugs and alcohol and then he would take Alta Vista to all these crazy parties and he would try to tell her you know do all of this with me let's have some fun let's loosen up and it is claimed that the reason he wanted her to loosen up is because that Sammy would try to get Alta Vista to mess around with other men and other women and just to build up on this rumor there is something else this involves pam greer so it's claimed that in the 70s sammy davis jr has a party at his house okay pam greer is there along with like elizabeth taylor liza minnelli and a few other people and so pam is just having a great time and then sammy comes and he's like rubbing up on her he's flirting with her and this is supposedly happening right in front of his wife alta Vise. He was apparently doing so much that Pam Greer started to get uncomfortable. And so at first she's still just standing there talking to him, but then it said he grabbed her by the arm and tried to take her upstairs in a bathroom. And so Pam is like, oh, wait a minute, uh-uh. So she ducks out of his grasp and she goes and sits on the couch between Elizabeth Taylor, Liza Minnelli, and she's telling them, is Sam always like this? Does he always try to talk to other women or do things with other women with his wife right here in the room? and said they were like, oh, psh, you know, that's how he always is. That's just what he does. You know, Alta Vista accepts it. Just don't pay any mind to him and all this kind of stuff. And then it said that finally Sammy Davis Jr. came and like stood in front of her and was kind of angry, you know what I'm saying? Kind of like, so you don't want to go upstairs so I can show you this bathroom? Really, you gonna act like that? And said that Pam was like, no thanks. I don't, you know, I just, just want to relax. And so it said that Sammy was on her case all night. That Alta Vista ended up feeling sorry for Pam Greer. And so she told Sammy to come over here, Sammy, let me show you something. And as soon as he turned his back, Liza Minnelli threw a coat over Pam Greer's head. They snuck out of the door and laid Pam Greer down in the back of her car and drove her away from Sammy Davis Jr. house. And y'all, I have been trying not to fall out because the tea has been a little bit too much, but baby, I just don't think I'm a, I just, so now to get into more sane tea, regular tea, gossip says that Sammy Davis Jr. actually married Alta Vise, or at least this was the rumor that was around at this time, that he had married Alta Vise to try to ingratiate himself with black people. If that is the truth, I do know that it is said that Sammy Davis Jr. was failing at this terribly. It is said that one time he went to a push show or some kind of benefit program or something for Jesse Jackson and he performed and he was booed off stage. Like the whole crowd who was black, they booed him off stage and it said that when he got off stage, he told a friend like, I'm I'm never doing that again. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to give a piece of me. I'm out there working hard and these people done booed me off the stage. I'm not doing this. And then the worst thing that he could have ever done he did in 1972 and that is when he supported Richard Nixon and that in itself well actually I ain't gonna lie that in itself still would have been kind of bad but it wouldn't have been as bad as it was but it's the thing that Sammy Davis Jr. did next with Richard Nixon that really set black people on fire. And that is when he showed up at Richard Nixon's campaign rally. And for some reason, while Richard Nixon was up at the podium speaking, Sammy Davis Jr. waddles his little tail right behind Richard Nixon and goes in for a hug, honey. Hugs this man from the back like he this man's wife or something. Know, what are you doing, sir? Why are you hugging on him like this? And, and black people did not like it. They didn't like it. A lot of them felt like it looked like some kind of master slave stuff. Like he just a, uh, yes, a boss, yes, a boss, yes, a boss. You know what I'm saying? That's what he looked like to them. Why are you hugging on this man? Rumor has it that it has been revealed since then that Richard Nixon told Sammy that he was going to alleviate his tax bill. That was the real reason that Sammy Davis Jr. hugged Richard Nixon, but nobody knew that. You know what I'm saying? And we still don't know if that's true today. That's just what rumor says. But back then, and nobody knew that people at home didn't know so for you to just come up behind him you know like oh Richard and hug him from the back that was a problem for folks so it just really really was not good for Sammy Davis Jr. as far as his career and that's why his career slowed down a whole lot 
in the 1970s and in the 1980s. Now, in the 1970s, he did have a song that came out called The Candyman, and that song was a hit. That was really the only thing he had going on in the 70s and the 80s. He started to do a lot of TV shows. He started to do a lot of guest appearances, you know, and stuff like that, but he was never up to the Sammy Davis Jr. that he was in the 60s and the 50s. Regardless of all of the failures that Sammy had in recent years though, he is one of the few, like I always make a point of saying, that became a legend in their own lifetime. And this was great, but being a legend does not pay the bills and it did not pay the bills. And in the 1980s, towards the end of his life, Sammy Davis Jr. was just about broke. He didn't have a lot of money. He owed so much in tax money and he owed so much in his debts that you know he, he really was under a lot of stress and then in august of 1989 it is said that sammy davis jr started to develop a tickle in his throat and he couldn't really taste his food well and when he went to the doctor they found a cancerous tumor in his throat now sammy was quite surprised with this news but it was not like he didn't know how this happened because it is said that he smoked just about four packs of cigarettes a day now the doctors offered to remove this cancerous tumor from his throat and basically told him that that is his best chance of survival but without that there wasn't really much that they could do and sammy told them well it don't matter i'm not gonna let you do any cuts or remove anything from my throat because that's my voice you know what i'm saying what am i gonna be without my voice and so they didn't do any cuts or anything but they did put him on chemotherapy and radiation and that did work but later the cancer returned and this time it was even more severe and so this time sammy was like you know what do what y'all got to do and so that is when they removed his larynx he was finally released from the hospital on march the 13th 1990 and he was sent home but unfortunately he still ended up dying two months later of throat cancer the day was may 16th 1990 and he was only 64 years old but get this though listen to this little scandalous tea baby why come is folks out here saying that people were actively stealing from sammy davis jr while he was at home in his sick bed child but listen to this little piece of gossip rumor has it that some of the stuff that was being stolen or removed out of his house was because sammy davis jr owed debt especially in taxes but it's claimed that frank sinatra ended up coming to the rescue and paying off Sammy Davis Jr.'s taxes. In the end, I am not sure what's true or false. Y'all know I'm just here to report the normal tea along with the scandalous, scandalous tea. And speaking of tea, since this is the end of the Sammy Davis Jr. video, y'all know there's some extra tea bombs to drop, baby. Let's get to them. It's claimed that he was one of the first out of the Rat Pack to mess around and sleep with Marilyn Monroe. The other rumor is about him and Eartha Kitt. It is rumored that they did mess around with each other. And then the very last one is Miss Lucy Lucille Ball. It is claimed that Sammy Davis Jr. did try to come on to Lucille Ball. He wanted to date her, but Lucille Ball shot him down. And so that is the very last of the tea bombs and the tea drops for Mr. Sammy Davis Jr. Honey, we are at the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. And I'm going to go now so I can prepare for the next video. Bye, guys. Love you.